Hello, and welcome again to History Obscura. Warmest welcome to all of you once more, dear friends. Today, as with most days, it is difficult not to be frequently reminded of a similar time in our past shared history. Humans are a funny bunch, aren't they? I mean, we, of course. <laughs> Ready for tonight's bedtime story? Good. Once upon a time, there was a lovely lady named Mary Mallon. Mary was born in Cookstown, Northern Ireland, in the year 1869, which was delightfully ironic because, as a grown woman, her main source of income was cooking. Aged just 15 years, Mary immigrated to the United States of America to live with an aunt and uncle there. In her new country, Mary was lucky enough to become a personal cook for several wealthy families, and eventually she moved to New York City to offer these services to at least eight households. In adulthood, Mary stood about five feet six inches tall with blonde hair and what were described as clear blue eyes. She had no trouble finding work among New York's elite and wealthy families, particularly in the summer months when many of them rented homes on the seaside. In the year 1900, Mary Mallon plied her trade in Mamaroneck, New York, until the family employing her fell ill with an unfortunate case of typhoid fever, just two weeks after Mary moved in. Typhoid fever is a bacterial infection typically spread through food and water contaminated by salmonella. Patients fall ill with high fever, diarrhea, and before antibiotics were developed to treat it, sometimes delirium and death. In Mary's time, there were no antibiotics. The next year, she moved to Manhattan, where members of the family for whom she worked developed fevers and diarrhea. The laundress died. Malin moved on to work for a lawyer and left after seven of the eight people in that household became ill. In 1906, a landlord in Long Island was questioned by local authorities after an entire family, renting his house, had become sick with typhoid fever. Detective George Soper was called in to trace the trail of infection and find out where it had come from. Soper had been previously hired by New York State to investigate disease outbreaks. He wrote, I was called an epidemic fighter and believed that typhoid could be spread by one person serving as a carrier. Soper discovered that the Oyster Bay residence had been rented by Charles Henry Warren, a wealthy New York banker who planned for his family to stay there for the summer. From the 27th of August to the 3rd of September, six of the eleven people present in the house were suffering from typhoid fever. At this time, the fever was still fatal in 10% of cases and mainly affected deprived people from large cities. Without regulated sanitation practices in place, the disease was fairly common and New York had battled multiple outbreaks. In 1906, the year Soper began his investigation, a reported 639 people had died of typhoid in the city. Initially, however, upon investigating the Oyster Bay outbreak, Soper believed that the family had fallen ill from infected clams 
It was not long before he discarded the shellfish theory and became increasingly interested in the family's hired cook, one Mary Mallon. Mary herself had only exhibited mild symptoms of the sickness, while the family she served had full-blown cases of abdominal pain, fatigue, muscle weakness, and toilet troubles. Upon investigating the cook herself, Sober discovered that seven of the previous eight families Mary had cooked for had contracted the typhoid fever. That was a total of 22 people showing symptoms of the sickness, three of whom had died from it, almost certainly in contact with Mary. From March 1907, Sober started stalking Mary Mallon in Manhattan and he revealed that she was transmitting disease and death by her activity. His obsession with obtaining samples of Mary's feces, urine, and blood became well known in the state. That year, about 3,000 New Yorkers had been infected by Salmonella typhi, and probably Mary was the main reason for the entire outbreak. Soper reasoned that Mary's normal hot cooked meals had little chance of infecting those to whom they were served because of the bacteria having been cooked and killed. It was discovered, however, that on most Sundays, Malin would often serve ice cream with fresh peaches. Soper posited that there would be no better way for a cook to cleanse her hands of microbes and infect a family. When confronted with this evidence and a request for urine and feces, Mary lunged at Soper with a carving fork. Thinking that perhaps Mary would be more sympathetic to the entreaties of a female, one Dr. S. Josephine Baker was dispatched to collect samples from the Irish cook. Baker was chased ungraciously away as well. She remained on the premises, however, for five hours, until finally Malin was escorted, with five policemen, to a hospital where, after a nearly successful escape, she tested positive as a carrier for Salmonella typhi, the bacteria that causes the fever. This would later be confirmed by more tests, she was quarantined in a small house on the grounds of Riverside Hospital. The facility was isolated on North Brother Island, a tiny speck of land off the Bronx. Malin herself had no symptoms of typhoid and did not believe that she was spreading it. It's likely she never did understand the meaning of being a carrier, particularly since she exhibited no symptoms herself, and made frequent attempts to escape. The only cure, doctors told her, was to remove her gallbladder. For a subset of infected individuals, Salmonella typhi colonizes the gallbladder and remains there long after symptoms subside, serving as a reservoir for the further spread of the disease. Mary refused to undergo what she clearly believed was a barbaric and unnecessary procedure. The New York American newspaper dubbed her Typhoid Mary in 1909, and the nickname stuck ever since. On June 30th of that same year, Malin invoked writ of habeas corpus to be released from captivity. The New York Supreme Court denied her request. In a handwritten letter to her lawyer, Mary complained, I have been in fact a peep show for everybody. Even the interns had to come see me and ask about the facts already known to the whole wide world. The tuberculosis men would say, there she is, the kidnapped woman. Dr. Park has had me illustrated in Chicago. I wonder how the said Dr. William H. Park would like to be insulted and put in the journal and call him or his wife Typhoid William Park. 
In February of 1910, Mary was unsuccessfully treated with hexamethylenamine, as well as brewer's yeast, urotropin, and laxatives. A new health commissioner was voted in that year, and he vowed to free Mary and assist her with finding suitable employment as a domestic, but not as a cook. Typhoid Mary was released on condition that she never work as a cook again. She was indeed released. In March of 1915, Mary Mallon was sent back to isolation after she was found to be working as a cook, under an alias, at a hospital, in the midst of a typhoid outbreak. She was forced into quarantine on two separate occasions on North Brother Island for a total of 26 years. She spent her days reading and working in the laboratory preparing medical tests. On Christmas morning, 1932, a man who came to deliver something to her found Mary on the floor of her bungalow, paralyzed. She had had a stroke of apoplexy and never walked again. Thereafter, for six years, she was taken care of in the Riverside Hospital. She died in November of 1938. Her body was hurried away and buried in a grave at St. Raymond's Cemetery. Nine people attended her funeral at St. Luke's in the Bronx. Thank you for listening. We have a brand new Facebook page, so do go check that out as well as our Twitter at Hist Obscura Pod. Do take a look at our Patreon as well and become a patron for extra content and prizes. Good night. Thank you.